That's a good one. It is good to come in the house and worship the Lord. Amen. 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 Worship prepares our heart for the planting of the seed of the word of God. Amen. Amen. Listen, I, I, I've, I've raised enough crops to know that if you just take seed out there and throw it on the ground, Gary, you correct me if I'm wrong. You, you just take it out there and throw it in the ground. You're not going to get much. But when you prepare the soil, you see, there's a thing in farming that's called a subsoiler. And a subsoiler is something of a massive fang or tooth or like a ripper on the back of a cat. And you bury that thing about three or four feet in the ground. And down there deep is what is called the fallow ground. Fallow ground is, is hard ground. And fallow ground every so often needs to be broken up. Amen. To allow the nutrients and, and water and oxygen to get down deep into the soil. And to release some stuff out of the ground. Amen. That's why the Bible says that we need to break up the fallow ground of our heart. Amen? Amen. It's, it's not just a, a, a catchy little phrase. It's, it's a truth and a reality that our heart needs to be prepared for the planting and the imparting of God's Word. The seed. Why do we plant seed? Gary, why do we plant a seed? For what? What's, for a crop. We want a crop. Whether you're planting alfalfa, and if you plant alfalfa, you're not going to get wheat. Corn, nuts. Or, or wheat or nuts or corn. You're going to get whatever seeds produce after their kind. And so when God's word gets planted in our hearts, it will, it will begin to produce fruit unto righteousness. Amen. And so I appreciate you coming and, and, and helping us to, to worship just for a minute. Um, I want to just back up just a touch here tonight and, and remind us that, uh, that a spirit of thanksgiving, a, a spirit, listen, how many of you know there's plenty in this world to be unthankful for right now? Amen. I'm, I mean, I'm unthankful for a lot of stuff <laughs> in, the, in this world. But we need to be reminded that the spirit of thanksgiving helps us overcome some of the sins in good standing. <laughs> huh? Some weren't here, I know. But sins in good standing, if that doesn't pique your interest when I say sins in good standing... Check your pulse. We've got an AED heart uh, shocker dealy over there. We can light you up if you're having trouble. <laughs> Amen. I don't know if anybody in here is qualified, but I'm more than happy to practice. Amen. I mean, I'm going to practice. I'm, glory to God. We can get some, Ron, I know what happens when you get lit, buddy. I know. Uh, uh, listen to this. The spirit of thanksgiving helps us overcome some of the sins in good standing. If, if, when I say sins in good standing, if that doesn't... <laughs> Since when did sins become in good standing? Well, let me qualify what I'm talking about here. Sins in good standing that, uh, that too often invade our lives. Sins in good standing are those sins that we put up with. That we, that we tolerate. Amen. Things like complaining. Probably none of us in this room complain. Huh? Mm -mm. Especially the pastor, he doesn't complain. No, sir. What about idolatry? What about idolatry? Go clean out your garage if you want to know whether or not you have some idols. Huh? 
because I've got a garage full of stuff. Actually, my garage isn't full of stuff. Every place else is full of stuff because I'm just building my garage. And Tammy keeps saying, well, we need to get rid of it. Well, I don't know. Uh, I might be able to use that, Gary. I, 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 remember, I remember who gave me that, you know. And so we put, we haven't seen it in 40 years, but bless God, we got to hang on to that thing. Would you believe me, Sierra, if I told you that I've still got stuff that you kids in the youth group gave me? I've still got it. <laughs> um, what? Did you hear her? She said, you're a hoarder. Did you know my mother? I am my mama's son, huh, Judy? Lord Jesus. Hey, listen, we can, we can make an idol out of all kinds of stuff. How's all the chairs positioned in your house? Just asking. Every one of them pointed right at the TV. <laughs> but it's not an idol. It's just a television set, right? All right, I'm going to move on. How about pride? Anybody have any trouble with that one? Ooh. Remember, I'm talking about sins in good standing, sins that we put up with, sins that we compromise, like complaining and idolatry and pride and ingratitude. Ingratitude. Being ungrateful. How, how many times do we whine and complain, I ain't got this and I ain't got that and I need this and I need something else, but I got a roof over my head, I got clothes on my back, I got shoes on my feet, and it, it don't look like I've been too missing too many meals. Amen. Amen. But if we're not careful, church, we will let ungratefulness come in like a flood. Sin's in good standing. See, it was when our first parents became unthankful that the human race began that terrible descent into sin and judgment. Because instead of being thankful for what they had, can you imagine, Gary? Can you imagine, Mike, being put in the Garden of Eden? The Garden of Eden. Where everything was yours. You could have anything in the place except don't mess with that. And God even came and visited them in that place. Walk with them in the cool of the day. Lord. Ungrateful. Look what happened. Instead of being thankful for what they had. Let me just tell you something. You might not have what I have. And I might not have what you have. And I might not have what the next person has. And you might not have what the next person has. But I'll guarantee you one thing. I bet there ain't a one of us sitting in this place that don't have a way lot more than what other people have. And they would be tickled clear to death to have our lack. Amen? So instead of being thankful for what they had, Adam and Eve believed the lie of the enemy. And I'm going to guess that every one of us seated, 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 that's a good word, every one of us seated in this place. Amen. <laughs> every one of us seated here tonight. Probably even everyone watching by way of the internet tonight on on the, on the video. I'll bet every one of us have believed at some point the lie of the enemy. Every one of us have probably been deceived. But the enemy told Adam and Eve, listen, the Lord's holding out on you. Can you imagine for a moment the Lord holding out on you? He said, all that I have is yours. How many of you know that we are, we are joint heirs with Jesus? <laughs> Listen, 
Me and my wife have a joint checking account, banking account, saving account. Is that right? There's only one. There's only one checkbook, though, I promise you, and I ain't got it. <laughs> and that's a good thing because she handles the money and I don't. <laughs> my point is this, because my name's on that account. I can go to that bank and I can draw out every dime in it and spend it on guns or hunting trips, tools. <laughs> He's just sit over there, Dennis. Good Lord. Did you hear what he said? You'd be sleeping with him, too. <laughs> Probably right, brother. My point is this. If that joint relationship that my wife and I have with our money is true, and it is, when, Jesus, when, when the Word of God says that I'm a joint heir, what's an heir? Pardon me? A descendant. An, 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 an heir is family. How many of you know we've been adopted? <laughs> Woo! Amen? I'm a joint heir. I'm part of the family. Everything Jesus has, I get. Listen, we've got so much to be grateful for, church. We, can't, we, just, we, we couldn't take the time tonight to name all the things that we, are grateful, that we are, should be grateful for. But they believed his lie. They believed that the Lord was holy. You know what the real problem here is? The enemy just... Spark doubt. Just a little doubt. Did he really say that? Yeah, that's what he said. And they paid the price, and we're still paying the price. Amen? It's what led to their sin. A thankful spirit, church, is a triumphant spirit. We need to learn how to be thankful. Ron, you remember back in the old days when we used to sing songs like Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One? Hey, we don't sing that song very much anymore. You know why? I don't think we're that thankful anymore. We take stuff way too for granted, church, don't we? Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Simple. It's simple. We just get so wrapped up in the day that we forget to count our blessings. I want us to be a thankful church. I want us to have triumphant spirits in this place. I want for everything that we do, for us to be able to find some way to be thankful. Amen? Listen, this isn't our home church. This isn't our forever church. But I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful that this, this block building has, has helped populate heaven. How many people have come to this altar and gave their heart to the Lord? How many people have we run through that stock watering tank over there, that baptism tank? <laughs> How many marriages have we done in this church? And funerals. It just comes with it. They're graduating to glory for crying out loud. So yeah, I'm, I'm thankful for this block building that God has given us. And I'm thankful for the one right out there that you have to see in your mind's eye. 
I'm thanking God for that already. We're talking about worship tonight, church. We're talking about what it means to worship and the fact that it is so much more than, than just singing a song. It's an attitude of our heart. It's, it's a, a, a lifestyle attitude. And we, for the last several weeks, we've been looking at, at what worship looked like in the Old Testament. Tonight, I want to kind of turn a corner and look at some verses uh, in the New Testament church. On worship, Amen? So turn with me tonight to one of my favorite verses, Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47. Acts chapter 2. 46 and 47. And I'm going to ask you one more time if you'd stand with me as we read these scriptures. I just think it's, it's a... And by the way, I want to commend you guys for standing up when the pastor started to read the, uh, the, the scripture on, on Sunday and y'all, everybody was standing up. I was doing this because I kept thinking he was going to read and I kept, I kept I was trying to almost jump the gun. But, but uh, I, you, I, you guys are getting it and I, and I appreciate that. Acts chapter 2 verse uh, 46 and 47. So continuing daily... With one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Father God, tonight would you just take these verses of Scripture, God, and make them very real to us tonight. I pray you would apply them to our heart. Help us to understand, God, that it's a daily walk with you. It's a daily walk with you, that daily we need to break bread, that daily we ought to consume our food with gladness and with simplicity of heart. And God, it's a daily thing that you have given us favor and daily... You have added to the church. Daily you are adding to the church. God, I'm grateful for a a daily ministry that you have given us. It's not just Sunday and Wednesday. Now be with us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now there's an interesting phenomenon that takes place between chapter 2 and chapter 6. And if you would begin to read in your Bible at chapter 2 and, and read through chapter 6, I can't give you the verse exactly or the chapter for that matter, but I think it's along about chapter 4. But the, the, the narrative changes. The vernacular begins to change. In fact, it doesn't begin to change. It absolutely changes dramatically. But the context, I believe, is established in verse 46 and verse 47. And especially uh, uh, verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord. Therein lies part of the problem with the church in America today. The church in America today has problems being in one accord. Amen? I'm so grateful that this church is a church that, uh, for all intents and purposes, at least from my perspective... um, it seems to be in one mind and one accord. We realize and we recognize and we understand that the ministry of this church is not to uh, uh, be the biggest or the best or this or that. Our mission for this church that God has given us is to reach one person with the gospel. Amen. Baptize one person for the gospel. Get one person rooted and grounded in in glory. And we have far succeeded in that. And we've got an entire city out here one at a time or two at a time or ten at a time. I don't care. But we need to bring them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this church is in one mind and in one accord in that regard. We realize and we recognize what it is. That we're about. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of every nation. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
So they continued daily with one accord. And what happens here is, is, is uh, that, that they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness. They praised God and had favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those being saved. So it goes, the vernacular changes. How, how many of you went to school? Anybody go to school? I went to school once in a while. A few times I went to school, a few times. I went to school often enough to know that there's a difference between addition and multiplication. Amen? I I understand that. And the vernacular in verse 47 is the church was added to daily. I believe it's in in chapter 4. I I wish I'd have thought about it to look it up earlier. But it changes from... It changes from the church was added to, to the church began to multiply. Chapter 6, verse 1. The church began to, read it for me, Sierra. Yeah. Yeah. People being ungrateful and feeling like they were being left out. The church is multiplying. How many of you know that this church will only multiply and it will only grow to the level at which I can maintain? Amen? How many of you realize that we're probably already there? We're probably already there. What what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying God is wanting to raise some of you up to help do the work of the ministry. Remember, it's a five-fold ministry. It's not just a pastoral ministry. There's an evangelical, uh, an evangelistic ministry. Frankly, I operate in those two ministries back and forth. I'm an, my wife says I'm an evangelistic pastor, and that's probably very true. But there's also the teacher I try and teach. I don't know if I'm a very good teacher or not, but I try and teach. See, I'm trying to fulfill all these five offices. Pastor, prophet, teacher, evangelist, and uh, what's, what am I missing? Apostle. Apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. That's all five of them. I've operated in all five. But God doesn't call us to do all five. He wants us to have folks around us to fulfill. Because, number one, I'll burn out. I'll burn out. And when you burn out, bad things start to happen. Amen? And so, uh, God wants to raise up some of you. The believers continued to use the temple uh, really for their place of assembly and, and, and ministry, but they also met in various homes. Let me, let me just throw this out there. Have you considered opening your home for a Bible study? I'm just going to leave it right there. See, they continued to use the temple for their their place of, of assembly and ministry, which would be our church, but they also met in various homes. See, the, there was 3,000 new converts uh, on the day of Pentecost. What's the population of Myrtle Creek? Pardon me? 3,500. 3, what are we going to do when the whole city comes and gets saved at once? That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people got saved on that day. Why? Because they were empowered by the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak in other tongues. Look at what happened. The the 3,000 new converts, listen, they needed instruction in the Word. And they needed something that we might not think is all that Important, but in God's economy, it's not really important. It's absolutely vital. 
and that is koinia. I threw you a curve, didn't I? Koinia is not a word that you and I typically would use, is it? Let me break it down for you, cowboy. Fellowship. Fellowship. That's what koinia means. That's why most churches have a koinia room. It's a fellowship hall. It's a place to get together and have our banquets and our potlucks and those kinds of things. See, they, they, needed, they, needed, a, they needed God's word and they needed fellowship. They needed fellowship. They needed not just any fellowship. They needed fellowship with God's people if, in fact, they were going to grow and become effective witnesses. That's why, church, when somebody comes to this altar and gets saved, I'm just giving you church one-on-one here for some reason tonight. But when someone comes to this altar and gets saved, we have somebody, and I couldn't even tell you just sitting here, I couldn't even tell you who it is, but somebody's supposed to be getting their information on one of these cards. This altar card right here, it says name, date, address, city, state, zip code, and phone number. And then you get to check the box. Did they get saved? Is it a rededication? Did they get healed, deliverance? Do they need pastoral follow-up? Those kinds of things. And, and when, when that gets filled out, what? Where does it go when it gets filled out? It goes to, doesn't it go to Glenda's mother? And she what? Follows up on him, makes a phone call. Why? Because you, we need to have contact. But if it stops right there, that fruit can die on the vine. Why am I saying all this? Well, I'll tell you why I'm saying all this. <laughs> because we need an army to raise up that will go after these people. That will reach out to these people. That will go beyond the norm and reach out to these people. 3,000 new converts needed instruction. How many of you know that Peter, even though he preached that message on the day of Pentecost... Peter could not minister to all 3,000 of those people. He, he was not physically capable. So they needed fellowship with God's people. So the early church did more than just make converts, they made disciples. Amen? And I've told you this before and I'm going to tell you again tonight. Because you need to keep hearing it. Because a disciple makes disciples. That's the job of a disciple, is to make a disciple. To take what you know, Gary, and teach it to somebody else. To the point where they can take what you've taught them and teach that to somebody else while you go and teach somebody else. And now we've went from two to four. And I've done this... A lot of times, but when those four get discipled, they go get four more. Now we've got eight. Why? Because now things are beginning to multiply. And it begins to multiply and it begins to grow exponentially. Which is a big word for a truck driver. Exponentially. The early church did much more than just make converts. They made disciples. Uh, and the church, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 44, the church was unified. The church was unified. They were a unit. Not only was the church unified, the church was magnified. My wife has a big magnifying glass about like that and my grandkids love to come to the house and get Mima's magnifying glass on a sunny day and go outside and try and burn stuff <laughs> they just think it's awesome huh I said, I wonder where they that. 
It wasn't for me. I didn't do it. I'm, I'm, I'm innocent as the driven snow. But if you take a magnifying glass, something that looks very tiny can get very big. The church was not only unified, it was magnified. It began to stand out. It began to look big. It began to grow and become big. Not only was the church unified and magnified, the church was added to. Not only was the church added to, but as Sierra has already pointed out in chapter 6 and verse 1, the church began to multiply. And here's the thing. Folks, listen to me. This church is never going to transition from addition to multiplication until the, the, the help is in place to handle the multiplication. It's just a fact of life. It wouldn't be very smart to go out and buy a thousand head of cattle if you didn't have somebody to help you take care of them. Right? God is not going to send us 3,000 sheep if we don't have some pens ready and some shepherds ready. Amen? Amen? Listen, Gary and I both know a little bit about cattle. Gary knows way a lot more about cattle than I know about cattle. I know one thing about sheep. You know anything about sheep? Do you know that sheep are a pain in the neck? Yep. Do you know that you have to work with sheep all the time? Cows, you can just take them out there and turn them loose. Right. Let them go, buddy. They'll go get them and they'll be several thousand pounds or several hundred pounds heavier than when you turn them loose and you can butcher them, whatever you want, take them to the auction, whatever. Not them stinking sheep. Them sheep, you got to monkey with them, you got to fuss with them, you got to do this and that and the other thing, or they you know, you got to be watching them get in trouble all the time if you're not right there watching them. Right, Sierra? <laughs> uh, you can't know how grateful I am to have you in here. Listen. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not teaching some new doctrine. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to rewrite God's Word. I'm not trying to, 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 do, to exegete the Scriptures or any of those kinds of things. I'm just trying to tell you that God's not going to send us 3,000 sheep if we don't have some shepherds ready. Amen? And, and here's the deal. As I look around in this place, for the most part, m most all of us have grown enough in the Lord that we can at least take somebody under our wing and begin to speak into them. Hello. The church was unified, the church was magnified, the church was added to, the church had a powerful testimony among the unsaved Jews. Not only because of the miracles done by the apostles, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 43, but also because of the way the members of the fellowship loved each other and served the Lord. Let me say this again. The church had a powerful testimony among the unsaved Jews. What are the unsaved folk saying about, listen, you can go to any Bible-believing person and they'll probably tell you some good thing about your church. Yep. You guys are just... Right? They don't want to be in trouble with God. So they're going to, you know... You can get an attaboy from the, from the church about any day. But what's the world saying? What's the unsaved folk saying? This event that took place on, on, on Pentecost, 
uh, or on the on the day of Pentecost, on the uh, when 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 the Holy Ghost fell and Peter preached and three thousand got listen. It had, because of it they had a powerful testimony among the unsaved. And not only because of the miracles that were done by the apostles, but because of the way the members of the fellowship loved each other and served the Lord. Church, I want to commend you again. We do a pretty darn good job about loving one another. We really do. But how are we doing at serving the Lord? How are we doing at serving the Lord? I'm, I'm not trying to be fun here tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not trying to be... I'm just trying to present the facts to you tonight. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. Because we, we, we do a great job. It was evidenced on Sunday by, at this potluck, if you were here at the potluck. Man, it was an outpouring of food. The, the word that the missionary brought was... was powerful the fellowship around this place was fantastic but but again how are we doing at serving the lord pardon me it i don't know it's all together a good question but 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 i think it's a question that needs to be asked I think it's a question that the body of Christ needs to begin to contemplate. And here's one of my jobs, I feel like, me and Tammy's job here in the the church is to, to change the mindset of the church folk. Because for years and years and years, Gary, you you people been saying, well, pastor, that's why we pay you all the money. You know, you go get them. You go minister to all them people. Well, let me tell you something. That's not according to God's word. God's word does not say that in it anywhere at all. I've looked. Ron, you've been in ministry long enough to know that you know it ain't in there. My job, Ron's job as a minister, Tammy's job as a minister, your job as a minister, if you're a minister, if you're a pastor, if you are, are the the the. the the man or the woman of God in the congregation, your job, biblically speaking, not pastorally speaking, biblically speaking, your job is to equip the body for the work of the ministry. That is what God said in His Word. The pastor's job, the minister's job, is to to equip the saints... For the work of the ministry. Who was it was having a, a dispute among the, wasn't it the Hellenists? And they were, ha- they were fussing because they weren't getting all their needs met. And, 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 and folks was just running ragged. And God said, hey, what? time out. You're going to kill yourself trying to take care of everybody. Divide it up. You guys go and do the work of the ministry and, and I'm going to stay here and I'm going to study God's word and I'm going to pray and I'm going to seek the Lord and I'm going to fill my mind so that I have something fresh to give unto you so that you can take what I've given you out to the people that need to hear it. And that was why it was so refreshing. When we got home, Tammy said, that, that preacher just been pre- preached the same thing that you've been preaching to us for a long time. It just came out of a different mouthpiece. And I thought, you know what? That's true. But I'm going to tell you something. This fat old bald preacher, I'll tell you right now, it was a refreshing drink of water for me. It was refreshing. The risen Lord continued to work in the people and the people continued to be saved. That's what church is all about. The Lord continued to work. What God's been doing here in a few Sundays and Wednesday services, people getting filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized and speaking in other tongues. I don't want that to stop. Tim, do you want that to stop? I don't want that to stop. I want that, I want that fountain to continue to flow. 
The Christians that we meet in the book of Acts were not content to meet once a week for service as usual. Well, I got a great response that time. <laughs> Preach on, Pastor. All right, I will. Bless God. Those folks in the book of Acts, that was not a once or twice a week gathering that them folks were having. Go back to verse uh, 46 of Acts chapter 2. The daily with one accord in the temple. Every day they met. They met all the time. They, they continued to, to meet. They, they met daily according to verse 46. They cared for one another daily according to Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. Here's one for you. They won souls daily according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, which we already talked about. And they searched. Oh my goodness, are you even going to say that? I am. They searched the scriptures daily according to Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 and according to Acts chapter 16 and verse 5 increased in number daily every day the church grew how many days have we been in this building we've been here two and a half three years how many how long we've we been here so for let's just for sound for round numbers 365 twice is what In round number 700, 730, is that factual or are we guessing still? That's factual, 730. Where, are, are, where would we put, if one person got saved every day from day one till now, where, number one, where are they? And number two, where in God's green earth would we put them in this place? That's not counting... 2014, I think we, we started over there. 2015 to 2000. All right, there's five more years. What's 365 times five? Come on, math man. What's 365 times five? Pardon me? 1825. 1825. I don't know how you're doing that, dude. But that's fantastic. What? What'd you say? She said, yep, he's right. Wow. <laughs> 18,000 or 1,800 and 25. 1,825 plus what was the other number? 730. What's that number? Smoke start. Fan him just a little bit. There's some smoke coming out of his ears. <laughs> How much? 2,555 people. Where are they? Number two, where are we going to put them? What's the population? We're only, a, we're only a thousand out from having the whole city in church. And the reality is, listen to this. This, the Lord just dropped this in my head. And it's rattling around. That's why I know. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of room. With all the other churches that are already in town, the other thousand might already be in them. Okay. I don't, I don't want to hear that. See what I'm saying? Every church in this city, your church, this church, every church, ought to be, number one, evangelizing. God did not say hold the fort till Jesus comes. He said go to the highways and the hedges, the byways. Fields are white under heart. You cannot, Gary, again, because we've both been in this business, you can't harvest from in here. Wow, Lord, I don't know where all that came from, but I sure appreciate it. Church, if you came here to, for me to make you feel good, you're in the wrong boat. You're in the wrong... 
because I'm here to tell you the truth. And the truth is, if we're ever going to be this, what we're talking about tonight, the New Testament church, if we are going to be the New Testament church, then we are going to have to do New Testament stuff. We are going to have to act like and be like New Testament people. We are going to have to wrap our mind around being a disciple. What does it mean to be a disciple? Being a disciple is sitting under a disciple and, and being discipled. How's that for factual for you? You're being taught something to the point where you can take what you've been taught to somebody that doesn't know and you begin to disciple or teach them what you now know to where they can take what they now know and teach somebody else that doesn't know it. That's what discipling is all about. They met daily. They cared for one another daily. They won souls daily. They searched the scriptures daily. They increased in numbers daily. Their Christian faith was a day-to-day -day reality, not a once a week routine put it up there it's not there my bad it's here i got it sir i got it underlined right here sir. i got it write this down their christian faith was a day-to-day -day reality it was not some kind of a pipe dream it was an everyday day in day out reality it was not a once a week routine in church i'm just going to tell you Another part of my job is to provoke you. It says in Hebrews that we are to provoke one another unto good works. And provoke means to incite to riot. Or to provoke means to put on a pair of spurs and put it in somebody's ribs. Hello, I've rode enough horses to know you put a pair of spurs in a horse's ribs, you're going to have a riot. It is going to riot. That's what my job is, to convict, to, 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 not to convict at all, not to convict at all, but to, to bring to you God's word so the Holy Spirit will begin to convict our heart. That listen, once a week in church, and I'm preaching to the choir because this ain't even Sunday and that place has got lots of people in it. So I'm, I realize I'm preaching to the choir, but here's what I need the choir to do. What do choirs do? Sing. They sing. Folks, we need to start singing. Not from up here. Out there. And I'm not talking about singing Mary Had a Little Lamb. I'm talking about singing the praises of God. Singing what, about what God is doing. Telling somebody. Running off at the mouth about how good God is. That's what I'm talking about. It was a day-to-day -day reality, not a once-a-week routine. Here's the reason why. Because the risen Christ was and is a living reality to them. So again, here's another place where I, I have to stop. I've been, I've been praying all day today, God, please, because I'll be honest with you, last week I felt like I was just going through the motions all last week. I felt like last Wednesday I could just throw it out the window and went home because it was just to me. And I said, God, I don't want that. I want you to work through me. And so I believe that that is exactly what is happening. Christ needs to be a living reality. We have to make up our mind, folks. we got to come to the place where we decide once and for all that Jesus Christ is who He said He is, who he, we believe He is, and, and that He did what He, we, what he said He did, and He's going to do what He said He's going to do. You want, how many of you want to be wise? Let me just see a show of hands. I want to know if you want to be wise. Wise. W-I-S-E. Put your hand up. Me and God both need to see it. Mary, put your hand up. Thank you. Do you know what Proverbs says? The wise win souls. If you want to be wise, 
Go lead somebody to Jesus. The wise win souls to Jesus. Good. Keep talking. Keep telling them. One of these days, somebody... Listen, I've thrown a lot of bait in a river. And I haven't caught a whole lot of fish. But every once in a while, some stupid fish comes along. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Some blind fish. <laughs> What's that? Some hungry fish. Some fish... Some, <laughs> some fish are just floating downstream because... Mm. What? Ron, you're taking me fishing. That's it. That's all there is to it. Do you see what I'm trying to say? The wise win souls, folks. Christ was a living reality to the disciples. Let me tell you something. Let me just stop for just a sec. Holy mackerel, I'm out of time. I haven't even covered a page. Let me tell you something, folks. What those 11 disciples went through post-crucifixion, if it was all a lie, I got news for you, pal. They would not have done that. They would not have done that. They would not have been dipped in oil or whatever it was. They wouldn't have been crucified upside down. They wouldn't have been beheaded. They wouldn't have been isolated off on some island. They wouldn't have done any of that kind of stuff if it was all just a made-up lie. Somebody in the bunch would have buckled. And they didn't. You know why? Because they knew it was true. And folks, me and you need to figure it out whether or not we believe that it's true. Yes, ma'am. After. 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 All the all the all the the apostles and the disciples that Peter and James and John all them were they were all uh, martyred for for Jesus different ways different ones of them and 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 they would not have done that if it was a hoax if it was a hoax they wouldn't have done that but they did do it listen I'm standing before you tonight tired and dirty but I know one thing. I was not perfect today. My day was not perfect. I was not a perfect person today. At no point during the day could I have walked on water. But I, I know one thing. I know that Jesus Christ is alive. I know that Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father and He's intercessing for me. I know that He has given me a new day. I know that He has put it in my heart to teach you folks this word. I know that he has put it in my heart today to tell the church that church as we know it is out the door, Tim. It is a new day. It is a new deal. And we need to be renewed in the spirit of Almighty God, folks. Amen? I want to tell you, you might not know this, but I'm going to tell you for sure, Jesus Christ loves you and He died for you and He didn't save you just so you could go to heaven. He'd have, if that was the case, Tim, He'd have took us the minute we accepted Him. He'd have just killed us and snatched us right out of here. But He did not do that. He left us right here. Why? Because He's put a message in our heart. He's put a message in our mouth. Some of us have bigger mouths than others. I'm just saying. He left us here for a reason. To disciple one another. To dis make disciples of every nation. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Church, I want, I'm a, I want you to... Let me, just go, let me just go back just a minute here. I've got to find it. Here's what, here's what I want. Did you, did you guys write this down? Write this down. Fred, real quick, type this up on an on a overhead. 
They met daily. They cared daily. They won souls daily. They searched the scriptures daily. And they increased in numbers daily. One souls daily. Search the scriptures daily. Increased in numbers daily. I promise I'm going to pray here in just a minute and cut you loose. I promise. I want to, I want to put this up on the, on the screen so that the people at home can see it, people that are live streaming can see it, because I'm about to, I'm about to lay down a, a, a challenge. We're working feverishly, folks. About to be here. You know what's happening? I've watched Fred type before, and Fred is fast. And he knows exactly what he's doing. And the enemy does not want us to have this. They met daily. They cared daily. They won souls daily. They searched the scriptures daily. They increased in numbers daily. If you haven't written this down, take a picture of the screen. Do something. Because folks, pardon me, folks, if, 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 if we're going to, if we are going to uh, be a New Testament church and walk in the authority and the power that the apostles walked in, we're going to have to start doing this. Do you agree, Ron? Do you believe that's true? Tim? Ron? If you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, if you're done feeling like you're not being effective in, in ministry, start doing that. You might not be able to do all, all five of those, but you can do one or two of them for sure. I know you can care for somebody daily. I know that you can search the Scripture daily. You can pray daily. If you don't have anything else to pray for, just pray for me. That'll keep you busy. That'll keep you busy. God might even inspire you to make a phone call. I appreciate it every day. Church, Jesus told the disciples, come follow me. Some of them had criteria that they wanted met. And what did Jesus say to them? Let the dead bury the dead. Foxes have holes, birds have nests. I ain't got nothing but a rock. Come and follow me. What am I saying? I'm saying he never said that it was ever, 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 ever going to be easy. But I'll tell you this. It'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. Father, I pray for every person in the sound of my voice, whether watching by way of the internet or whether seated in this room tonight, and I pray, God, right now, 
you would infuse every one of us with your Holy Spirit. God, that you would begin to pour out your Spirit on us, in us, and ultimately through us to a world that is lost and undone. And God, we have just crunched a few numbers here just real quick tonight, and we've come to the conclusion that our church isn't big enough, and our ministry team is not big enough. And the reason why our church isn't full is because we don't have teams in place or people in place to handle 3,000 souls. But God, we're going to keep preaching like we got 3,000. We're going to keep preaching, we're going to keep teaching, we're going to keep giving, Lord, like, like there's no tomorrow. And God, I pray that, that the rest of this week, I pray, God, though, tomorrow morning when the women get together, there will be something profound take place, whether through the word or through a testimony or just because of your presence in this place tomorrow as the women meet. As the men get together on Friday night, God, and begin to share, I pray for something spectacular to happen right here in this house at 6.30 on Friday night. I pray, God, that your men would come together, Lord, that we would in fact meet together, that we would care for one another daily, that, Lord, maybe somebody would be there that we could lead to Jesus. Lord, we will read your scripture that night. And, Lord, I pray that our number increases, Lord, in that time. I pray the same thing over the women's ministry. Lord, and I pray, Father God, for Sunday morning, God, that your Holy Ghost would already be prepared in this place, that your folks, your people would come into this house, God, not waiting to worship until they get here, but they would come into this house filled up with with your Holy Spirit, pouring out worship and praise unto you. God, that when we begin to sing choruses, Lord, I pray, God, that this place would erupt with an angelic voice, Lord, of praise and worship for your glory and for your honor. And then when, Lord, your word is preached, that your word would be, as your Bible said, a sharp two-edged sword, that, God, it would cut to the very marrow. Lord, it would divide the, the, the soul and the spirit. And, God, that your word would be planted in our hearts that have been prepared through the plowing and the breaking up of the fallow ground, through praise and worship, God, that your seed would get in and it would produce a, fr a, a crop, some 10, some 50, some 100-fold. And when the altar calls given, this altar place is filled with people hungry for you that need a touch from you, God. Lord, and right now, on Wednesday, I give you praise and glory and honor for what's going to happen on Sunday. And Father, I thank you for it all right now. God, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said amen, amen. and amen. Amen. Listen, if you wrote that down, if you took a picture of that on the, on the screen, I want you to figure out some way to practice some of that this week until Sunday. Amen? I want us to begin to do that every day, every day, every day, every day, and see what God begins to do in our lives, individually and corporately. Amen? Remember what I said earlier? We're in one mind and one accord. We do a pretty good job. Let's stay in one mind and one accord. Let's begin to sing to the people that aren't here on, on Wednesday night. Let's just begin to sing to them about how good God is, what God's doing, what God has done. Oh, you can't believe it. Glenda says it from the pulpit uh, during the announcement. Tammy says it when she does the announcements. But what happens when you start saying it? What happens when, when Dorothy starts shouting it from the rooftop? You can't believe what God's been doing. You can't believe the teaching that's coming, and we know it ain't coming from Pastor Shane. Anybody that knows him knows that that ain't true. It's just God's Holy Spirit working through. Listen, was it, was it Moses? Moses and Aaron. Yeah, Moses. He said, I can't even talk. God said, don't you worry about talking. I'll put the words in your mouth. Don't worry about it. I'm that, I'm that guy. I'm not near as smart as I sound. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I know that sounded corny. But I'm telling you what, 
Let me, I, nobody argued. That's a true statement right there. Let me tell you something. God will take, listen to me. God will take your ordinary and put some extra with it. And you and I can become extraordinary for the glory of God. I know that to be true because I know me. I thought it was going to be real smart. I don't know why I'm even going to say this. I'm just going to be transparent. I did not graduate from high school. And it's haunted me my whole life. It's haunted me. I can't, I can't, I can't talk with my friends about how great it was after the graduation ceremony, what all we did. I can't talk about that. Fact of the matter is, my graduating class was 1977, and I've yet to be invited to a class reunion. You know why? Because I didn't graduate. So you know what I did? I said, you know what, Shane? You know what you're going to do? You're going to go back to that high school. You're going to get your transcripts. You know what them are. And you're going you're to get your GED. So as you can at least say you did that. And I went out to that high school and I said, hey, I want my transcript. They said, okay, shouldn't take us long to gather this up. And they was right. I think my, my GPA was like 1.25. I was good in shop classes and PE. And I read that and I thought, I made it this far. <laughs> I'm Book learning does not work well with me. But, but experientially, and God's Holy Ghost, I'm not beating myself up, I'm making a point. I'm just making a point. You don't got to be the sharpest knife in a drawer to cut. Amen? All you got to do, listen, I'm telling you the truth. I ain't no good at book learning. But when God begins to pour in your heart, when God begins to open his word up to you, you can be dumber than a bag of hammers and still learn something. I'm just saying. Folks, if, if he can use me. How old are you, Sierra? 40 years old. She was 17, 16, 17, 13, 14 when she came into our youth group. And now she's 40. And she's still serving the Lord. She's hit some rough spots in her life just like every one of us have. And I'm not trying to call her out at all, Sierra. I'm just making another point. God used me all those years ago to reach some young people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God ain't done using me as much as the devil tells me you're done. You and I have already had this conversation about how God will come to you and tell you you're done, you're no good, you're useless, you're this, you're that, and then somebody will make a phone call, somebody will call, somebody will say hey, somebody will send you a text message, and all of a sudden it's like, man. Saddle up, cowboy, let's ride. Every one of us, church, it's not just me, it's every Dorothy, as old as you are, as old as you feel, as old as you think you are, as, as much as you may feel like, God's done with you. And, and Mary, you the same way. Judy, you the same way. Your prayers are before God and he hears them. Don't ever quit praying. Don't ever quit talking to people about Jesus. Don't never quit, church. God loves us. You young people, maybe you've had some rough spots in your life as well, and I'm sure you probably have. You want to know what my Bible says? Gary, my Bible says that my latter days are going to be better than the former days. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know about tomorrow. But I know who holds my hand. Amen? Amen. Father, I, I just love you, and I didn't mean to preach again. But somebody need to hear that tonight, Lord. Encourage your people, Holy Spirit. Encourage this preacher tonight, Lord. God, I pray that you would use every one of us, Lord, for your honor and for your glory. Ultimately, for your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Thanks for being with us tonight on the internet. I pray God blessed you some way through this word tonight. See you next Sunday.